The word nightlight connotes a safe, warm place for children. It connotes home. So we are lighting the path toward adoption for the families who come to us and would like to adopt, as well as the path toward home for children who are living in a dark world. For instance, here's a young boy named Vector. He lives in the nation of Kyrgyzstan. People sometimes ask me, where's Kyrgyzstan? And so I explain to them, it's, it borders Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Kazakhstan, but not Uzbekistan. So they'll, um, it's south of Russia. And Vector's one of what UNICEF calculated as 168 million orphaned children in the world. If we were to gather all of the children who live either on the streets or without parents as orphans, they would comprise the seventh largest country in the world. My wife and I went and spent 10 days with Vector and his other children who were in his children's home in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And my wife, at the end of these 10 days, she placed her hands on this young man and she said the words that Jesus said in John 14, 18. She said, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will send someone for you. And Jesus promised that to, to his disciples about the Holy Spirit. He said, I will not leave you alone as orphans when he goes to the Father, but will send the Holy Spirit to us. Well, Nightlight Christian Adoptions is acting out the words of Jesus, the call of Jesus, to not leave people as orphans, but to provide for their needs, to come for them. And what is their biggest need? Of course, it's for a family. And shortly thereafter, we found a couple named Courtney and Bryn who adopted Vector, and he now lives on the East Coast here in the U.S. And we're working on emptying out that children's home in Bishkek, and then we'll move on to the next one. The program that we have at Nightlight that's given us the, the most publicity, including three invitations to the White House, as well as hundreds of national media placements, is called Snowflakes. Snowflakes is an adoption where you give birth to your adopted child. And that's, of course, what most people want to do when they are interested in adopting. The reason we call them Snowflakes is they are frozen embryos. And if you think about snowflakes, it's very different from what Dr. Beals was talking about with millennials who are sometimes called snowflakes. We came up with this term in 97, before anyone was talking about millennials being snowflakes. Snowflakes are four things. They're tiny, because they're frozen embryos. They're frozen. They're unique, every one of them, because they're human beings. And they're a gift from heaven, because these are frozen, precious human beings who were created by in vitro fertilization and frozen as embryos by their parents. But couples create these embryos and they put them in storage and they have their biological family, they have their two children, and then they have no plan. And there's people in this room who have frozen embryos in storage. Everywhere we go, every church, every time I speak, there are people in the room who have embryos in frozen storage, and they have children from those embryos, and they look at their children and they recognize, I've got a few more of you guys in storage, in the freezer. And Christian couples especially know that these are precious lives for which they are responsible. So they call our agency, usually from hearing from Focus on the Family, has been the primary source of driving donors to our program. In fact, John and Marlene Strage in 1997, they're pictured on the photo here, or Marlene and her daughter Hannah with President Bush. The, the first snowflake adoption through our agency in 1997 was possible because after the Strages came to our agency and said, what do you think people do with embryos? And our agency said, we'll try to find a place for people to donate embryos. So then Dr. Dobson started speaking on Focus on the Family, appealing to people, saying, donate your embryos to an adoption agency where there's going to be a home study and a matching process by social workers and an openness process afterward where you can actually visit the child who was born and send gifts and send cards. So it's an adoption process related to embryo donation. So through that program, we've had almost 700 babies born 
through the snowflake embryo adoptions. And this was a program that President Bush uh, names twice in his own autobiography as something that was dear to him, as well as uh, the, the program has sparked several other similar adoption, uh, embryo adoption programs throughout the country through what's called the adoption, Embryo Adoption Awareness Grant that President Bush started in 2002. And the purpose of the grant was to divert attention and money from stem cell research, embryonic stem cell research, and save those embryos instead for people to give birth to them. And it's proved to be very successful. The, stem, or the uh, embryo awareness grant is still around, although it was threatened for an eight-year period, as you kind of imagine, after President Bush. But uh, we still are receiving those grant funds in order to raise awareness that you can adopt an embryo and give that embryo life. So, of course, this uh, program is deeply rooted in, the, in Psalm 139 that says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And we know that the embryo is already a human life at conception. But the other program that we started in 1959, as our agency was founded in Whittier, in association with the National Association of Evangelicals, that's our charter organization, there was a problem in 1959 of women facing unplanned pregnancy who needed a family to adopt their child. And we just call that infant adoption or domestic adoption. And that's what our agency started with, and we've helped over 3,500 women just in Orange County since 1959 place their babies when they've been faced with an unplanned pregnancy. Women like Shay, who's pictured here, she was 16 years old when she placed her baby for adoption. And she spoke at an event at Dodger Stadium called Go to Bat for Life about her decision to place her baby for adoption and what it's been like since. And she said she views herself as an aunt. She still knows the family who adopted her child. She still sees her child a couple times a year and is in relationship with them. This is called an open adoption. It's different from the types of adoptions in the 50s and 60s where people didn't know that they were adopted or women didn't know who adopted their child. We do open adoptions where both parties can talk to each other for the rest of their lives, sometimes directly or sometimes through our agency. So there's not this void inside their heart where did I come from? Who is my family? Or in the birth mother's heart, where is my child and how are they doing? So we facilitate open adoptions. Before Roe versus Wade, before 1973, 8% of pregnancies resulted in adoption. But after our agency had been around for a couple decades and abortion was legalized, the number of pregnancies that resulted in adoption fell to less than 1%. So the other 7% of pregnancies that used to have been resulting in adoption, many of them are now resulting in abortion. So after Roe versus Wade, we obviously had to change our mission from not just domestic placement, but to looking globally. And the next thing we did was start a orphan host program from Russia in 1989. Our director at the time, his name was Ron Stoddard, he, as soon as the Iron Curtain fell, he went to Russia and he just started talking to people about how can we do adoptions and how can we get these kids to the U.S. so that families will see these kids and say, I can do that. So we conceived of an orphan host program where children from Eastern Europe at the time, now we do it from all over the world, would come to the United States for one to three weeks. And they would come before church and they would sing or dance or perform. And they would often be teenagers or 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and we wanted someone in the audience to say, I've always thought about adoption. I assume I wanted a baby, but now that I see these kids, I, I can do that. I can picture myself parenting these kids. So they would go back to their country of origin, and then the families would be inspired to adopt. And we've had over 3,000 adoptions since 1989 from other countries most of them were in some way prompted through a host program. 
So we bring children twice a year from other countries. Ephesians 1.4 says, In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It, I often see this truth of our predestined future, the, the promise that God gives us to give us a hope in a future, when we work with adopted children and families. The girl, one of the girls pictured in this host program here, they're, they're dressed with Russian clothing because of their performance, but one of the girls' name was Luba, and I remember at one of our events, someone asked Luba, when you first met your parents, were you afraid? And she said, no, because I just looked at them, and I knew that they were my mother and father. Isn't that a beautiful thing? My wife and I had a similar experience when we went to Kyrgyzstan and adopted our daughter, whose name is Idana. It, the adoption process takes several months. It took us about five months with three trips to that country. On our first trip, on the first day, our daughter Idana was told, you have visitors. That's all they said. And she, as soon as we walked into the room, she stood up and she announced to all of her peers, hello? My mother and father are here. I'm going home now. Goodbye. <laughs> now, it was not that simple. We actually had to leave a week later, and then three months passed, and we didn't see her for that time. And she was very angry when we came the second time three months later, and she said, where have you been? And we said, we have to do paperwork. And she said, I'm, this was a five-year-old girl. She said, I'm not paperwork. I'm a person. And that is certainly what we think about every single day and what we do. We are not just doing paperwork. We are rescuing children from ignorance of the gospel, from poverty, and from the life without parents. And when you think of the types of nonprofits that we can support, one of the things I love about what we do is that the work that we do is absolutely certain to succeed because the children are certainly brought out of poverty, they're certainly brought into a Christian home, and they're certainly rescued from that condition of not having parents. So we uh, are able to solve these problems the children are facing. Now, we have a group, a small group of donors. As I was flipping through my booklet, I, just, I noticed that the number of donors we have proportionately is a lot smaller than a lot of the other nonprofits who present. And I think that's because we're largely a fee-based agency uh, rather than other nonprofits that are 100% dependent on donations. But nevertheless, some of our donors are very clear on why they give. I, I called one of our donors named Paul who lives in Lake Havasu and his children were adopted, his grandchildren were adopted from Russia. And I said, Paul, I just want to thank you for donating to our adoption scholarship fund so faithfully. And he cut me off mid-sentence. I wasn't even able to finish that. And he said, I owe Nightlight a debt I could never repay because you've given me my grandchildren. And that's why we have a small yet dedicated group of donors because they're people who are experiencing the blessing of Psalm 113, verse 9, that says, he settles the childless woman in her home as the happy mother of children. And that's what we get to see, thousands of families who've been settled in their home as the happy parents of children. Now, this is my daughter, Idana, who I spoke about previously. She was adopted when she was five from Kyrgyzstan. And she was in our home for just two weeks and spoke only Russian. So, yes, she's an Asian-looking child who spoke only Russian and was brought into our home at five years old. Nevertheless, in Russian, we had to learn quite a bit of Russian in order to communicate with her for the first year. And when we had my parents over in the first two weeks just to visit with us, they, we sat down for dinner, and she took charge of the situation. And she said, Mama, you sit here. Grandpa, you sit here. Grandma, you sit here. We're going to eat. And my dad said, I see that she has gone from orphan to her majesty in two weeks. <laughs> But isn't that exactly what the Bible says God will do with each of his children? Each of us who were born into one family, the family of sin, children of Adam, and we were adopted 
into God's family, called out of our former family, adopted into God's family, and our inheritance before was death, but our inheritance now is to be children of the king, our inheritance of life. So it says in Romans 8.15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear, but rather you have adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, most of our agency's past is in, uh, work is in Orange County, and yet we also work in 10 other states. Uh, we have a reunion every summer where we bring kids together, and we have emptied out some of the orphanages from Russia, like Ro orphanage number two and 32 in St. Petersburg. Someone asked one of the kids at this orphanage, do you miss your friends back in St. Petersburg? And she said, no, because they're all here. So we're trying to make a, an impact on the needs of children globally and locally through each of these programs. Um, the, the last point I want to make is that you, we had a man who was in his 80s come to us and ask if he could adopt. And we said, you know, we do have an age limit, but you can do something. And I know that not everyone here is planning to adopt, but everyone here can do something to help with our mission of providing a family for every child in need. So if you look at this sheet, please think about and read